ultimately Intel recruited me. When I joined Intel, my new boss at the day sat me down and said, we're so excited to have an anthropologist. We have no idea what you're going to do. Excellent. Very liberating that. And she said, but however, there are two things we know we need your help with. And I said, excellent, two is a good number. What are those things? She said, well, we need your help with um, women. And I said, which women? Because that seemed like a good question. And she said, all women. And I said, all 3.6 billion women? She said, yes. OK, um, what exactly do you want me to do with 3.6 billion women? She said, it would be good if you could tell us what they wanted. I thought to myself, excellent, there's a project. What do 3.6 billion women want? And I think I was probably sitting in my head imagining what a project that would look like that would convey the wants of 3.6 billion women to a silicon making company when I realized my boss had said there were two things that they needed help with. And I said, somewhat frighteningly, what is the second thing? And I think I desperately hoped she'd say men, because that would round out the equation. But instead she said ROW. And I wrote that down and then realized I was well on my way to becoming the worst employee in history because I said, what's ROW? She said, that's rest of world. <laughs> and I took a very deep breath because I feared, much like the rest of us in this room, I came from rest of world. And I said, um, so what's world in this sentence? She said, that's America. And I said, so just to recap, you'd like my help with women and everyone else. She said, yeah, that'd be great. And I thought, well, either I'm going to have a really excellent job or I'm going to be dead in six months as I attempt to explain everything else to this place. I'm happy to say it turns out the role of women and the rest of the world turns out to be a very good one. It's a place where there's a lot of work to be done, as many of you know in this room. There's always a story to be told and there's always something that you can learn that's different. And my job at Intel has been about bringing those stories about the rest of the world and women and men at this point um, into the conversation and using them to drive new technology development. And I thought I was doing incredibly well until I was in a meeting not that long ago and my colleagues came back and said, listen, we've heard you, we need to think about people when we develop new technology. That's great, and we've found some people and we're using them to guide our technology development. And they showed me these people. And I looked at these people and I said, who are they? And they said, well, they're our users. And I said, okay, um, so sort of anthropologically speaking, or so sociologically speaking, um, where do you think you're going to find three generations of white people, all in the same room, all watching the same content, all smiling at once? <laughs> I'm like, what do you mean? I'm like, you found Canada. <laughs> or possibly New Zealand. But not big markets, right? I'm like, what are you saying? I'm like, this is a complete fantasy, right? Nowhere in the world do you have small children and white furniture. <laughs> we all know that, just practically speaking. I couldn't work out how the global financial crisis had become so bad that George Bush Sr. was doing print ads. <laughs> There's no clutter in this room, and every one of us who lives a life or has been in another person's home know there is inevitably clutter somewhere. And then someone else in the room, getting into the kind of spirit of this, said, yeah, and in what world does she get the remote control? <laughs> and I was like, oh, good. We found a picture of the users we wish we had, because this is really seductive. This says there are a group of people sitting around waiting to be delighted by us with nothing we need to compete with, no competition, no other rituals, just a blank slate that we can write ourselves onto. And if you're an engineer or indeed a broadcaster, that's a pretty seductive vision. It's also completely not true. And so we spent a while, my team and I, sitting around going, oh my god, how do we disrupt this, right? And we came back with this. We said, listen, the picture of the future is in fact some bloke on a fake leather sofa in an apartment complex in Hong Kong, where there is enough content in this room, he never leaves to leave again. There are seven remote controls. There is an automatic foot massage machine, a fax and photocopier, an air conditioner, a television, a DVD player, a VCD player, and a Blu-ray player. And, oh, by the way, all of that stuff was what we were going to have to compete with. If we want to make a piece of technology or you want to make a story, it's got to be good enough that it cuts through all of that. It's got to be so compelling or delightful or comforting in some ways that it becomes a ritual that finds its room in that space. And for us, as we think about what it takes to make good technology, it's about how do you find room in all of that? How do you make something so compelling someone unplugs the automatic foot massage machine? That's a big ask. Or how do you tell a story so compelling that someone's willing to switch channels and stay with you? And for us, the business of using social science research, of thinking about technology development, of thinking about the future, is about making sure of two things. One, that we're honest about the present, and two, that we create enough space that what the future might look like is what will really emerge, and that we are, in fact, in some ways, writing towards that future, not trying to contain it. 